From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! I will take a backseat to no one in my commitment to network neutrality. Because once providers start to privilege some applications or websites over others, then the smaller voices get squeezed out and we all lose. The internet is perhaps the most open network in history, and we have to keep it that way. That was President Obama in 2007. This week, federal regulators unveiled new rules that would effectively abandon net neutrality. We'll speak with former longtime FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. Then author Astra Taylor asks, is the internet truly a people's platform, taking back power and culture in the digital age? It turns out that the web reflects and even amplifies real-world inequities as often as it ameliorates them. The rich, in fact, tend to get richer online, attention and influence accruing to those who already have both. While we can all like and tweet and share, the appearance of equality online is far more illusory than internet boosters like to admit. And finally, it's the 50th anniversary of the World's Fair in New York. This fair represents the most promising of our hopes. It gathers together from 80 countries the achievements of industry, the health of nations, the creations of man. This fair shows us what man at his most creative and constructive is capable of doing. We'll speak with Norman and Velma Hill, two members of the Congress of Racial Equality, who led more than 700 protesters demanding fair hiring practices at the World's Fair and called on President Johnson to pass the Civil Rights Act. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ukraine is warning it'll continue efforts to retake control of eastern areas from pro-Russian groups, despite warnings from Russia. Tensions have escalated after Ukrainian authorities said they killed five pro-Russian separatists near Slovansk. Russian President Vladimir Putin has announced new military exercises on the border and warned of unspecified consequences. On Thursday, Secretary of State John Kerry warned the United States could take further action against Russia if it does not back down. Seven days, two opposite responses, and one truth that cannot be ignored. The world will remain united for Ukraine. So I will say it again. The window to change course is closing. President Putin and Russia face a choice. If Russia chooses the path of de-escalation, the international community, all of us, will welcome it. If Russia does not, the world will make sure that the costs for Russia will only grow. And as President Obama reiterated earlier today, we are ready to act. A U.S. journalist has been released by pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. Vice News correspondent Simon Ostrovsky has been held since Monday. He says he believes he was targeted for his reporting. They had my photograph at a checkpoint that's just down the road from here. And so the guy at the checkpoint saw my picture, saw my face, and then they pulled me out of the car and all hell broke loose. There was four other journalists uh, with us in the car, and um, I think they were released pretty early on. Um, and me, they took to the SBU headquarters, where the pro-Russian forces have their headquarters right now. President Obama has left Japan without sealing a deal on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a secretive pact among Pacific Rim countries to establish a free trade zone encompassing nearly 40 percent of the global economy. The deal has faced mass protest in Japan by farmers and others who say it'll cause large-scale poverty and displacement, like what happened in Mexico under NAFTA. Obama said a deal could still be reached if Japan further opens its economy to U.S. products. Obama continues his Asia tour in South Korea today. Israel suspended U.S.-backed peace talks with the Palestinians following a unity pact between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Israeli officials say they'll only resume negotiations if the PA abandons the deal with Hamas, which Israel deems a terrorist organization. 
The Marshall Islands is suing the United States and eight other countries, accusing them of failing to meet commitments for nuclear disarmament. In an unprecedented legal action brought before the International Court of Justice at The Hague, the tiny Pacific Island nation accuses the nine countries of flagrant violations of international law, saying they're upgrading their nuclear arsenals instead of working to reduce them. The Marshall Islands chain, which includes Bikini Atoll, was the subject of 67 nuclear tests in the 40s and 50s, which have left lasting health and environmental impacts. A federal judge has dismissed criminal charges against a former Blackwater guard accused of firing the opening shots that triggered a massacre of Iraqis in 2007. At least 14 civilians died in the Nisar Square massacre, including a nine-year-old boy. But the judge dismissed the indictment of Nicholas Slatton after a federal appeals court ruled the charges had been filed after the statute of limitations expired. Prosecutors may seek new charges ahead of the June trial of three other Blackwater guards in the case. The decision comes as an Army sergeant faces a possible court-martial for killing two unarmed Iraqi boys in 2007. At a preliminary hearing this week, military prosecutors said Michael Barbara shot the two brothers as they herded cattle, posing no threat. After an earlier investigation in 2009, Barbara received a letter of reprimand prompting accusations of a cover-up. Native Americans and ranchers are continuing their week-long protests against the Keystone XL oil pipeline in Washington, D.C. On Thursday, the Cowboy and Indian Alliance rolled out a fake pipeline in front of the Lincoln Memorial and called for leaders to reject the project. So our message to, to the Canadian government is, is, you know, let's do what's right for North America. Let's not, uh, you know, capitulate to uh, multinational corporations and their greed. We do not want to pollute our water and destroy our land. We want to see our children and our grandchildren survive on the plains as our forefathers have done for many generations. We need President Obama to reject the Keystone XL pipeline. Thousands of protesters are expected to join a march on D.C. on Saturday. The Obama administration's delayed a decision in the pipeline for the third straight year. Federal regulators have unveiled changes aimed at preventing deadly black lung disease among coal miners. The long-awaited rule lowers the amount of dust allowed in mines and requires new technology to monitor dust levels. Black lung disease has been on the rise in the United States since the late 1990s. Vermont is poised to become the first state in the country to require labeling of genetically modified foods. Governor Peter Shumlin has vowed to sign the bill passed by state lawmakers Wednesday. The measure also bars foods with GMOs from being labeled as natural. The measure would take effect in July of 2016. Connecticut and Maine have passed similar laws, but theirs have clauses that prevent them from going into effect until neighboring states require the labeling. U.S. postal workers rallied outside staple stores across the country Thursday to protest the shifting of their jobs to non-union retail workers. At issue is the opening of postal counters inside staple stores, which are staffed by employees paid far less than union postal workers. An Arkansas judge has struck down the state's strict voter ID law, saying it violates the Arkansas Constitution. The law requires voters to present a photo ID before casting a ballot. It was enacted last year after the Republican-led legislature overrode a veto by Democratic Governor Mike Beebe. A Nevada rancher whose stand against the federal government became a right-wing cause celeb has been caught on tape making racist comments. Cliven Bundy refused to pay decades' worth of fees for grazing his cattle on federal land, prompting a standoff with federal rangers, during which an armed militia of supporters flocked to his aid. In comments quoted by The New York Times, Bundy discussed what he termed, quote, the Negro. So now what do they do? They abort their their young children, they put their young men in jail because they never they never learned how to pick cotton. And I've often wondered, or are they better off as slaves picking cotton, having family life and doing things, or are they better off under government subsidy? Right-wing figures, including Fox News host Sean Hannity and Republican Senators Dean Heller, Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, have all condemned Bundy's remarks after they publicly supported his case. 
The Navy has reassigned a former commander of an elite fight, uh, flight squad and is investigating claims he presided over rampant sexual harassment. Captain Gregory McWhorter served two stints as commander of the Navy's Blue Angels, an acrobatic flight demonstration team. Last week, the Navy announced he had been relieved of his most recent post as executive officer of a base in California. An internal military document, which was accidentally emailed to an editor at The Washington Post, shows a former squad member filed a complaint against McWhorter last month. He's the latest in a series of senior commanders to face investigation amidst an epidemic of sexual assault and harassment in the military. The issue of sexual assault on college campuses is in the spotlight. Brown University is under fire for allowing a student who raped and strangled a classmate to return to campus after what amounted to a one-semester suspension. The victim, Lena Sklove, said her assailant was found responsible for sexual misconduct by a university panel, but will still be allowed back in the fall. Surrounded by supporters, Sklove described the injuries she sustained in the attack. It turned out I had a cervical spine injury in my neck from being strangled. Um, it's very common for trauma injuries like this to take several months to surface. Um, I could not walk for about two months from January and February. I was bedridden and was forced to take a medical leave. So I lost my one semester of freedom. And now my next opportunity to come back as a student to matriculate here at Brown is the same semester that the rapist is allowed to come back and matriculate here at Brown. I feel like I should have been thanked by the administration for keeping this campus safe. Um, instead, they kept him safe. Brown is not the only Ivy League school facing scrutiny for its handling of sexual assault. Students at Columbia and Harvard University have filed complaints accusing their schools of violating federal law by failing to adequately protect survivors and punish perpetrators. Last month, a Harvard student published an open letter titled, Dear Harvard, You Win, detailing her unsuccessful battle to have her accused assailant moved out of her residential house. An imprisoned Black Panther, Mumia Abu-Jamal, turned 60 years old Thursday. He has spent more than three decades in prison, much of it on death row, until his sentence was commuted to life in prison in 2012. He was convicted of killing a Philadelphia police officer, but is widely seen as a political prisoner. Mumia thanked his supporters in a birthday recording made from prison. I breathe today because you fought for my breath. The state hates you and attacks you because you fought for me, with me, every step of the way. I'm humbled by your support and energized by it. Struggles like this prove the possible, and we are not done. Mumia Abu-Jamal's supporters are holding a Celebration of Life Festival in Philadelphia Saturday to celebrate his 60th birthday and call for his release from prison. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.